Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Special Fronteras, a changing America. Today in our monthly series dealing with Latinos and mental health, from stigma to treatment, we take a look at the role stigma plays in Latinos seeking mental health. Today my guest is Enrique Mata, Senior Program Officer with Paso del Norte Health Foundation. Mr. Mata, welcome to Fronteras. Thank you very much. As we start out the conversation today on stigma and mental health, why don't we start it out by having you explain a little bit about the role of El Paso del Norte and mental health. Well, uh, Paso del Norte Health Foundation uh, has a mission to promote health and prevent disease in the region through leadership in health education, research, and advocacy. Uh, we serve the counties of Doña Ana, Luna, and Otero in New Mexico, as well as the counties of El Paso and Hudspeth in Texas and Ciudad Juarez. Our, our, uh, our priority areas are health eating and active living, alcohol and tobacco control, mental and emotional well-being, and healthy relationships. Under those areas, we provide health promotion uh, grants to local nonprofits, but we also do research, advocacy, and uh, leadership uh, education. How did Paso del Norte decide recently to become involved in the mental health, wheel, the mental health uh, well-being of uh, our county residents? That's a, a, an area that is challenging. We, we've known for years that there are uh, issues that we need to address in the mental and emotional well-being arena and uh, took a stand on it in uh, July of 2012. Uh, but primarily because the foundation does not fund uh, illness treatment, we are looking at the health promotion side of it, which we have to address things like stigma. Stigma is an important barrier that we need to look at, understand, and find ways to overcome. Now, you know, one of the things in, in doing research for this program and, you know, this series, one of the things that, you know, comes across very strongly is that mental health does not discriminate. You know, it crosses all cultural and race barriers, not just in this country, but worldwide. Looking at the issue of Latinos, you know, in the U.S., we are a melting pot, you know, come from Central America, South America, from different areas. And then when you throw in the assimilation of multiple generations in this country, you, you've got yourself a group that's not homogenous. How does cultural stigma affect Latinos and mental health? Certainly culture is an important factor as that to consider when we're talking about stigma and mental health. Uh, one of the things that comes up that we see in, uh, consistent in, in various studies is that um, family and connectedness are a very important uh, and integral to uh, folks recovering from mental illness. And you're right, when we talk about uh, mental and emotional well-being, at any one point in time, any individual can experience a trauma or have a, a situation where either their family member or themselves have an, an emotional uh, uh, problem and need to seek attention. You know, Latinos, um in our region in particular, uh, we uh, see that uh, the Latinos face a high level of poverty, uh, lower levels of educational achievement, lower insurance coverage, and cultural and linguistic differences. How do these barriers add to the stigma of mental health in Latinos? Certainly the barriers bring, bring up concerns like getting timely uh, access to, to, uh, to treatment options. But uh, one of the things that we have to understand about culture is that it can also be a strength and that not necessarily is it a barrier. Sometimes keeping that social connectedness within a family and the prevention of isolation comes from understanding that uh, recovery is possible from mental illness. And what we mean by recovery is that it doesn't, th that you can live a good quality of life to the best of your ability. And that that is inclusive of being uh, socially connected to your family. And so when we talk about culture, we talk about it being uh, maybe a barrier because people think of it as taboo mental illness and we need to stop talking about it. Much of that has to do with education, understanding that uh, mental illness is, uh, is an illness and that there, there are treatment options for it. Let's talk about stigma and some of the stigmas that, that come, you know, some of the myths, some of the facts that come with, you know, when uh, Latino families might hear, well, your son, your daughter, or somebody in your family uh, has a mental health disorder yeah. or an issue. What are some of the concerns that you hear from people say that they have and some of the st stigmas that they may have as a result of learning when this is happening? 
Well, we've heard a wi wide array, and uh, some of them are, are things like uh, signs and symptoms, maybe that uh, maybe an individual is, is a binge drinking more than, than usual, or, or drinking more than usual binge drinking, or that there's uh, situations in the family where individuals are consistently angry, or there's, there's uh, symptoms of a person ha experiencing extreme sadness for a long period of time, and they don't want to talk about it. The family members start to isolate and say, well, they'll be okay, just leave them alone, or uh, looking at it like, um, <clears throat> and we've seen these in our situation analysis that we did recently uh, of the region, is uh, folks saying if we talk about it with our, uh, with our neighbors or our friends, we're going to be stigmatized as a family. So there's that fear, that, that fear of not being accepted in a community. Well, one of the things that I uh, frequently hear, and again, is uh, nervios, tienen nervios, right. they have nerves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so let's let, let it be. I mean, it, it's again, at what point do we, is there an educational process to let them know, and you know, how does your organization work to present some kind of educational uh, campaign to let them know that it's not just nervous? Right. Our work under our Think Change initiative, which is a very new initiative for the foundation, our first steps were to develop a foundation of support systems and education programs, evidence-based programs that we've seen work in other communities, but look at them and have them uh, modify to ensure that they have a cultural uh, uh, connectedness within the education. And uh, again, it's, it's, it's something that you need to look at from the standpoint of uh, families' beliefs and values and saying that, well, let's give you the, the, the clarity of the myths and facts, but understand more that there are other people out there in, in the world that, experiencing, uh, that experience these situations and, and you can recover from mental illness. So that kind of education, uh, providing that to the community and helping community members understand that you can talk on your own terms and access treatment on your own terms, that that is, that is a, an option for you, is important for families and we want to see that that, that message is conveyed. Well, you, you talk about families, and you know, uh, the way I hear it is la familia. Right. The familia comes together to support them. You know, what role does familia play in stigma and the, you know, the seeking help, uh, mental health help? Right. Well, there's a, a wide range of, of, of concerns that come up, and you know, one of them you addressed in, in, in the beginning is that that strength, you know, that there's a sense of machismo sometimes, that aguantese, you know, or be, uh, be strong, you know, it'll, it'll go away, uh, this is, you know, and, and really not looking at what are the underlying causes of all of this, uh, all of these problems. But from a standpoint of culture, we know over and over again from research that if you don't have that familial connectedness, you are less likely to, uh, to experience uh, options for recovery. You're less likely to seek them out, you're less likely to have the support system to help you manage and complete a course of treatment for your mental illness. One of the things that we see in the border region is, you know, uh, new uh, arrived immigrants, uh, whether legal or illegal, and you see a lot of uh, sole providers. And a lot of times you also see in some corners of our area where you see, you know, family members that are here by themselves and have family, you know, either in Mexico or in their home country. And some of them might be suffering from mental illness but may not be aware. What is being done to address these issues among, you know, these newly arrived immigrants that may that may be here and may not be aware that they're they they are should be diagnosed as having a mental health disorder. Uh, well, there's some first steps, and you're certainly right that there's some challenges with that. Uh, what we do see, though, uh, and some opportunities that we've identified is that there is some resiliency in folks who are coming first first uh, first generation uh, migration into the United States, where that family connectedness uh, gives them some degree of resiliency where they're able to manage through some emotional hardships like isolation, things like that. Uh, but what we do have is uh, programs out there, for example, the, the foundation recently funded a program called the Mujer a Mujer, and there's a curriculum that we're providing, and it's in Spanish, and it's out in, uh, in the uh, regions, in the outskirts of El Paso County, and we have trained some folks into the southern New Mexico areas. And this program helps uh, mothers to understand the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety and understand what kind of resources are available should they start experiencing these kinds of signs and symptoms that are more than just trying to cope with life events or changes in, in, in things or isolation, but more than that and finding understanding how you can get help and help not just for you but for your family members. 
Uh, one of the things you talked about, and again, you know, getting back to the issue of machismo, you know, the gender roles that, you know, are played in families, you know, again, being strong or, you know, saying, you know, I can handle this, but also dealing with um, self-medicating, you know, and self by self-medicating we mean, you know, alcohol abuse and as a way to cope w with this, uh, with this illness. Uh, how prevalent is that among the Latino culture? Well, prevalence is difficult to, to grab onto as far as uh, prevalence of relationships between mental illness and, and uh, things like binge drinking. Uh, but certainly we can see some connections to uh, uh, mental illness and, any, and, and uh, a wide range of, of, of uh, other medical disorders. So if you've got uh, situations where you may be uh, recently diagnosed with cancer or diabetes or things, uh, there can be an underlying uh, depression or anxiety that needs to be addressed as well. And sometimes folks may not follow through on their medications correctly or may not follow through on their, uh, or, or may try to self-medicate and manage themselves in a different way than what might be best for the, the illness that they've got. So you're right, uh, there are some concerns with that and we have to understand better how that works and that's one of the approaches the foundation will take is to try and draw, draw better data for this region. What role does the church or religion, spirituality play in Latinos and uh, who are seeking or know that they must seek mental health? Well, we certainly, uh, as a community, uh, Latinos and, uh, and this Paso Norte region, we do look to religious organizations and uh, they are certainly an important part and play a role in support systems for counseling. The, uh, the thing that we're investigating about this community is understanding how prepared are pastors and, and priests to handle a serious mental illness crisis. And so we will investigate some of that. While those support systems are important and they need to be promoted and, and, and we need to see how best to work uh, alongside them because uh, families will go to their, 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 their churches and, and look for this kind of support. We also need to help them understand and, and be uh, able to uh, appropriately refer folks when they're in need of more than just prayer, prayer or, or counseling support. As Latinos grow and grow more and look to, you know, become the largest minority uh, group in the country, I know you work here with, you know, in, in the Norte area, in, in this border region, but, you know, how prepared is this country to provide help to Latinos that might be seeking mental health problems? You know, there's some great new opportunities developing ar around uh, treatment systems, and, and so, reducing stigma is going to be important because we are seeing that uh, with the passing of mental health parity acts and with uh, affordable care act people will eventually have better access to health services and we hope that we'll, we'll see better options in this region uh, and if you don't those those support systems if they increase we also need folks to be willing to go through the door to access those services so helping them understand how to get to the services as a country we're working to find the answers and uh, I think we've seen that from uh, efforts to try and identify what were the root causes of, of bad situations like shootings in schools or or the recent uh, uh, military uh, uh, events but uh, trying to find out what the root causes of these are and look at ways that we can provide timely treatment. Um, when we look at stigma, it's going to be a barrier and we need to, ho we need to understand how to, how to proactively uh, address that barrier so that folks, when those treatment options are available, that they understand that they're there and that they can access them through some no wrong door type of system. Well, I, I always look to it this way in asking this question. I mean, how our organizations like like Paso del Norte working to get ground troops on the floor to get them to go out there into the community to say you need help and here's how we can help or right. you need help let's talk about educating your family and educating yourself uh, right. you know or, or, or besides your organization are there any other organizations in this country that are working to do this oh certainly and uh, you can see uh, collaboratives building uh, around this arena we w we work with uh, other foundations around the country uh, through a connectedness with uh, behavioral health funders networks and uh, but we also take what's been learned in other areas and we look at how best could those those uh, opportunities develop here and using those uh, those uh, those connections um, 
we can, we can see what, what best can work for folks in the community and how best to implement those with the organizations that are local. One of the things that foundations do is we, are, uh, we try to develop a leadership role to be a neutral party so we can bring these uh, organizations together and convene around the issue at hand, getting aside, setting aside all of the uh, personal or competitive agendas and really look at how best can we help serve this community with the with the limited resources we have. So learning from other communities on how this has been done, what success is, we can inform groups and convene in that leadership role. And, and that's really a great, uh, a great position to be in and, and uh, a really good opportunity for this region. Let's talk about how to overcome some of these stigmas. Uh, one of them is, you know, what will everyone think? Um, will their loved one be sent away as a result of, uh, of, uh, of this, the shame you know, uh, the gender role. I mean, is it, uh, if, if the daughter has it, how do they handle it? I mean, you know, how do you overcome or educate the community in overcoming some of these stigmas? Well, it's certainly a, a more complex than how I'm going to simplify it right now, but uh, one of the models that we've looked at is a model developed by uh, Dr. Patrick Gorigan and, and some of his research teams. Uh, they're a, a research team out of Chicago, but uh, they look at defining stigma in a realm of education, protest, and contact. And we look at protests, we talk about marches, things and saying, well, you should not, uh, in the media, show people who have mental illness in a derogatory way. You shouldn't call them psycho or you shouldn't, you know, and, and then looking at it at person first language so that you're saying this person is afflicted by a mental illness, but looking at it as they're lesser than others, that they're not, they're different. And so that kind of protest, uh, folks like National Alliance for Mental Illness help to prevent that kind of stigma being uh, perpetuated inside the media. From the education standpoint, behavioral health literacy, understanding the myths and facts around mental illness, and that folks truly can recover from mental illness and live a healthy and, and uh, productive life with their families. And then the, uh, from the contact side, that's the one that's a little bit more uh, understanding that folks who have been in a, in a uh, have been afflicted by mental illness and have recovered and successfully getting to know those folks and understanding that somebody like me or you could have had a mental illness and and would certainly be recovering and be able to talk freely about it and say you too can recover that kind of that kind of opportunity to hear someone talk about that we want to make that more open and uh, help folks to understand better that it's not just a select few that really any one of us can uh, can be in that situation. So when we talk about it, education, protest, and contact, we're really looking at this you know, wide array of, of options to help. And you can only do that in a multi-level way. So it's not just going to be one education program that's going to be the end-all, be-all. It's going to be a coordinated approach where we work collaboratively with our partners. Well, you know, the um, you've been doing this, Puzzle North has been doing this for almost two years now. Just about. Just about two years. And what changes have you seen just since Paso del Norte started doing this? And, you know, those changes, but, you know, what are, the, what are some short and long-term goals to really get the message out? Right. Well, what we've seen uh, is, first off, we had to understand what uh, is stigma a problem for this region. So we engaged a, a group called Behavioral Assessment Incorporated who came through and uh, provided us with a situation analysis of the region. And this was a, a recommendation that comes from folks like the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration saying if you're going to start an initiative of this type, this is one of your first steps. Understand to what degree this problem is in your region affecting uh, folks. And so we have great data on that now. We now have a report and that's posted online on our website. And we're hoping that those data will help inform us on our next steps. One of the things that we did know uh, from this report is that we are uh, sorely lacking in evidence-based programs to help. Uh, uh, for example, there's an, a program that's known internationally called Mental Health First Aid. And we only had about three people that were certified to provide this program in our entire region including Hudspeth, El Paso, Doñana, Luna, Otero counties, and Juarez. And this program is internationally recognized as a program that can help reduce uh, or, or promote understanding and uh, helping folks that are, are uh, who might be experiencing a mental health crisis, helping those around them to be able to support and get those, those individuals to help in a timely manner. 
Uh, it also gives those folks that go through the program a general understanding of mental illness and uh, depression, uh, schizophrenia, these kind of things to, to help them in, the, in their own families. So what we did was we increased the number of uh, folks who are trained to provide this program in this region. That's, we now have a little more than 30 people who are trained to provide mental health first aid in this region. And those folks are now providing uh, training to others uh, for the region. So that's a first step. It's a, it's a first step. It's a foundation. And we're hoping to do things like media campaigns, advocacy for policy change that will help us to have more, more free options. Uh, when I say free, meaning that people can make those healthy choices and those, those resources are available to them when they choose to make those, those, those choices. Well, one of the um, issues, or one of the many issues is, you know, uh, as far as stigma goes, um, you know, we didn't address this earlier, but you know, the, the assumption that some of these children or teenagers will grow out of it. And how, again, going back to the educational process, do you go about getting the message that, you know, while not necessarily being able to grow out of it, that there needs to be some form of treatment? Right. And that is a, a, a complex area. When we talk about children and youth, certainly the foundation has got an emphasis on future generations. We have to. Uh, if we're going to make any difference in the long term for this community. And uh, we're looking at how best to address uh, children and youth programming uh, to ensure that, one, the programming itself doesn't cause uh, stigma, stigmatizing attitudes within the folks. We're looking at how, how do bullying programs, how are they working now for, for people and uh, is that something that will help reduce the barrier. But we're also looking at that connectedness. Are these children connected to healthy programs? Is what they're experiencing a result of a recent trauma, adverse childhood experience? And how best have they gotten the support to, to, uh, to address the, the, the emotional trauma that they experienced? So we're looking at a lot of those options right now. Again, it's in first steps. Well, you know, I mean, to add to this, I mean, what role and challenge is there with lack of medical coverage, you know, health insurance uh, for these communities that might not have health insurance? And is there any growing outreach to provide affordable health care in the mental health field? We are uh, certainly working with uh, uh, groups who are, are increasing the number of folks who are being enrolled in the new opportunities for health coverage. Uh, we had a project uh, that we uh, helped to get underway called Enroll El Paso. And uh, we've looked at similar types of projects in other areas where we can just increase the number of folks who are covered by health insurance, but also uh, looking carefully at the behavioral health system and how uh, some of these resources are, are referred to by uh, different partners that we have. So if you have a group that maybe doesn't have insurance, maybe there's a federally qualified health center which the Health Resources Service Administration from the federal government provides these federally qualified health centers of which there's several around this region uh, and uh, one might be uh, in this community would be Ben Archer and those groups can take folks in who don't have otherwise other coverages and they, they have a support system in place that will help get folks to the services they need. So those kind of options are available and getting folks again to understand that those options are available and that when they go seek those options that they can ask these questions and it's okay to ask these questions about behavioral health. In the last past two, in the la last two years, um, almost two years since you've started this project, what has been the most you know, revealing surprises as far as mental health in this community that is very glaring, that really warrants immediate action? Immediate action. Uh, well, one of the major things that really requires immediate action is our workforce. We are sorely lacking in health providers. And when we look at the number of psychiatrists or even clinical psychologists, that are available for this community to handle uh, child health uh, cases, to behavioral health, we are sorely lacking in those numbers and we need to see how best we can recruit and retain more health providers in this region. And what is the, do you have uh, um, your website uh, that people mm -hmm. can uh, uh, contact just to learn more Certainly. about Paso del Norte? So www.pdnhfpasodelnortehealthfoundation.org, so it's 
pdnhf.org. Uh, on that website, we have our information, and we also have information on the organizations that we funded. So you can uh, get the names and numbers of folks who have uh, the educational programs we funded and other groups. We also have research reports on there that we have looked at and how we're using those research reports to help uh, enhance the, uh, the, the mental and emotional well-being of this community. To wrap things up, I mean, you know, one final question is, how do you see the role of, you know, new immigrants to people that are, uh, to groups that have been here for a longer period of times that might have already, you know, have integrated into the society and, you know, might use, uh, might have English as a primary language now? Right. Uh, in this community, you know, as far as the foundation goes, since we, we do fund Ciudad Juarez and we understand that the Paso Norte region is a region where we, we have almost a hybrid society. Families are on both sides of the border and they are challenged with uh, staying connected. Uh, but we, we do know that there are great opportunities because of the resilience that, th that these individuals have. We do know that even looking at the isolation that uh, folks have a good, strong uh, family belief system. And if you can keep that family belief system and keep uh, children and youth close to their parents, keep them talking to each other, we know there'll be better health outcomes. So keeping a family connected, keep them connected with other community members, programs like uh, Promotora uh, programs out there are certainly important to helping folks have that trusted connection to the community without fear of being identified or, or, uh, or, or uh, uh, si singled out in a particular way. Well, uh, Enrique Mata, Senior Program Officer with Paso del Norte Health Foundation, we want to thank you very much for being here today on this special uh, Fronteras, uh, Stigma to, uh, to Care on Mental Health. For those of you that like to learn more about our series on Latinos and Mental Health, From Stigma to Treatment, please log on to krwg.org. Thank you.